did. And so the bishops, uh, out of fear uh, of safety for their people, recommended that they, for this year, not have public services. You know, we don't have to experience, most likely, that kind of hot persecution. We might have sort of a cold persecution, in a sense, but not that kind of hot persecution. But many of your brothers and sisters are right now in prison, being tortured, and facing murder, being murdered, or having their family murdered in front of their eyes because they follow Jesus. Think of that. I pray that you and I never have to endure those sorts of things, but I do sometimes wonder about myself. Would I be strong? Would I be able to do that? And only, I'm here to tell you, <laughs> only by a miracle of the Holy Spirit would I be able to confess, as Stephen did. To be stoned to death would not be a pleasant thing to face. Uh, about a month ago, my family and I watched a movie from 2010, a, a recent film, that I recommend to you. It's not necessarily for children, but it's called The Stoning of M. Soroya. It's based on a true story of a woman in Iran who was stoned to death. Okay, and I won't, I won't explain to all the, this, but it's based on a true factual account and, uh, but to give, but, but even, and it's a 20th century story. This happened in the 80s, okay? Right after the Shah was deposed. And um, uh, even though it happens in modern times, this village in Iran is uh, very, um, well, I, I think they probably lived in very much the same way that people lived in the time of the Bible. So you, by watching it, uh, there's the occasional car driving by, but much of the film, I think, would give you a feeling or a sense of what it might be like to live in a culture where people are hostile. Now, in, in this film, I should clarify, she's not accused of being a Christian. She's not stoned for that reason. But every week, I open email from uh, an organization called Voice of the Martyrs or, or another Christian news agency about someone in Pakistan, someone in Iran being hung, stoned, flogged for being a Christian. It happens every, I don't know if every day, but frequently. And you know what? I don't see that on the television news. You don't hear that in our uh, weekly paper. But it's happening. It's the story of, um, of Christianity. Now, it might seem a little off to be talking about stoning and martyrdom on the day after Christmas. <laughs> But it's really not so strange. The whole story of Jesus Christ is about sacrifice. It's bloody. It's a bloody story from day one. You know, we didn't read this on Christmas Eve, but if we had read from Matthew's Gospel, uh, we would read that around the time of the birth of Christ, Mad King Herod in Jerusalem ordered that all the infants in Bethlehem be slaughtered because he heard rumors of a king being born and he wanted to destroy all competition. Now, King Herod, we know quite a bit about from history. He was, uh, he'd killed uh, some of his own sons. Um, I, I see Bill Everson in the back there, and, and uh, he told me recently he was reading the works of Josephus, and uh, Josephus uh, tells us a bit about King Herod. And one thing they used to say about King Herod was, um, uh, you know, he was Jewish, right? So, uh, so he followed kosher, but uh, he, he had murdered several of his sons and wives and whatnot. And, and the saying at the time was that it's safer to be Herod's pig than his son. The babies of Bethlehem were being killed, uh, at least in the narratives, um, in association with the birth of Jesus. There may have been several years of time lapse in there, but, um, but the story is closely tied to it. The Hebrew prophets foretold that their Savior would be one who suffers. Jesus Christ is not Santa Claus. He did not come to fill our stockings and eat our decorated cookies. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to destroy the work of the devil. 
He came to become the final sacrifice for sin. From the time of his birth, and even unto eternity, he was appointed to spill his blood for you and me. That's the ultimate meaning of Christmas. You see, you can never separate... Take note, you can never separate the cradle from the cross. Here's the thing about martyrs. Martyrs don't keep their faith private. They open their mouths and they sometimes get into trouble for it. Martyrs, here's an important distinction. Martyrs are not people who die for their convictions. They don't. They don't die for their convictions. They die for speaking about their convictions. Many people have had Christian beliefs and lived safe lives and never get hurt. The key is to keep your mouth shut, to blend, and you will not be injured. But as soon as you open your mouth about Christ and the Christian faith, and I don't mean in an obnoxious way, we don't all have to be Stephen calling out, you hard-hearted. But when we make our faith known in a winsome, humble way even, you will be reviled and ridiculed as crazy, as stupid, even as evil. It's true. There's a story in the, another ancient uh, martyr named Ignatius. Ignatius was a very early Christian pastor in the city of um, Antioch in Syria. Uh, Ignatius is interesting. He was actually a converted and a disciple of the Apostle John. That's how close we are. Okay? And we know a lot. Ignatius wrote seven letters, which we still have. We can read. Well, Ignatius um, was killed by the Emperor Trajan in around the year 110. The Emperor Trajan uh, had enjoyed some success on the battlefield, and he insisted that all of his subjects, all the subjects of Rome, join him in thanking the pagan Roman deities. You know, let's, let's make prayers of sacrifice and thanks to uh, uh, the Roman gods. But the Bishop Ignatius refused. One record says that Ignatius said, What you call gods are no better than devils. There is only one God, the true God who created heaven and earth, and His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And for that confession, he was arrested from uh, Antioch in Syria, taken to Rome, and literally fed to lions. <laughs> Um, for you know, and for a modest fee, you could buy a ticket, and for your afternoon entertainment, watch the Christians get devoured by beasts. Not everyone has the opportunity or the calling to be a martyr for the faith, but every Christian is called to be a witness. Not all witnesses are martyrs. Most of us are just confessors in the way that we speak, in the way that we live. You and I may never be asked by God to lay down our lives literally in the sense of being beheaded or stoned to death for following Christ, but we are called to sacrifice our lives in the sense of giving all that we are, all that we possess to God. We are called upon to become living sacrifices, like Wenceslas. That is, to put the needs of others before our own. By sacrificing your life, it's not a sacrifice for sin, because your sins were paid in full by Christ on the cross. But all Christians are to follow in the footsteps of the King. Even in bad weather, even to the point of death. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Please rise.